I invite you to take God's Word and turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want to step back into our study of this wonderful New Testament book, and as you know, we find ourselves in this remarkable chapter that is known as the love chapter. We have been taking our time as we have come to verses 4 through 7, as we have looked at these 15 distinguishing marks of love. In fact, we have taken one message each for these uh, 15 uh, virtues of love, and this morning we come to the 15th and final aspect of what true love is. We'll find it at the end of verse 7, but I want to begin reading in verse 4. The title of this message is, Love Endures, beginning in verse 4. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and now our focus for today, endures all things. Winston Churchill once attended a formal banquet in London along with other dignitaries, and at this function, all of the famous dignitaries were asked this question. If you could not be who you are, who would you want to be? It was an interesting question. And as the different men addressed this, everyone was waiting for Churchill's answer, who is the man of the century, not only in England, but in all of Western civilization. If Churchill could not be who he is, who would he be? The way it worked out that evening is that all the other famous men spoke first, and so with a sense of climax, the question came to Churchill. Everyone leaned forward to hear the question. Would he say Julius Caesar? Would he say Napoleon? Would he cite some other luminous figure in English history? Churchill said... If I could not be who I am, I would like to be Lady Churchill's second husband. In other words, I would want to still be married to my wife. And if I was to live another life, I would simply want to be her second husband. And that is a love that endures all things. That is a love that goes on and on, and that is the final quality of love that Paul sets before us here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love endures all things. I think that we can safely say that this final virtue is the most important of all 15. It finds itself in the climactic position. It finds itself in an emphatic position. Everything has led to this. And none of the previous qualities of love would have any meaning were it not for this last mark. For example, as we looked at verse 4, love is patient. If love is patient but does not endure, then love is not patient, love is impatient. Or the second mark, love is kind. If love is kind but does not endure, it is really not kind but is easily and quickly unkind. Without this dimension of love, all the previous qualities of love are in reality shallow and superficial and short-lived. It is this last quality of love, love endures all things that makes love deep and rich and robust. True love lasts, or it's not really a deep, true love. 
Uh, true love endures, or it's only a passing infatuation. A true love goes on, or it's only something of the moment. And before we look at this, let me ask you a few questions. To what extent does your love for others endure all things? Do you give up on people? Do you write them off? Uh, do you start relationships but then pull back? and walk away from them at the slightest disturbance? Do you go the second mile with people? Do you forgive 70 times 7? Do you press on in relationships despite differences? And do you persevere through difficulties? Surely each one of us stands in need of greater endurance and our love for others. And that will be the focus this morning, and Paul will challenge us as he tells us, love endures all things. Now, I have several headings that, with which I want us to look at just these few words, these three words, love endures all things. I want you to note first the substance. What specifically does this word endure mean? A proper understanding of its meaning will reveal something of the substance. Now, this is not shallow, superficial love. This is substantial, steadfast love. And when he says love endures all things, this verb connotes the idea of perseverance and tenacity. It means specifically to endure in tough times. It means to keep on loving people despite difficulties in the relationship. It means to persevere despite even opposition and rejection that the other person would put up. And here it means to endure in loving someone else despite whatever withdrawal they may have towards you. It is important for us to note that this word endure that you see here it's actually a military word. It's a military term that meant to stand fast against the assault of an enemy. It was used to describe an army holding its position in the midst of combat. And so we normally associate these words with being read at a wedding and, and pertaining to marriage. And usually there's violins playing in the background and, and mothers are crying. And, and it's a very... Uh, uh, emotional, uh, sentimental experience that we associate with these verses. But I want you to know that this verb here, endure, and I'm going to show this to you, is a word that is used in conflict. Uh, it is a word that is used in the midst of difficulty. It means to endure in loving someone uh, despite being under attack. Now, I want to take just a moment to talk about this word a little bit more fully. It's a compound word. It's, it's, it's one word, endure, in our English language. But as Paul writes this in the Greek, he takes two words and brings them together. One thing that does is intensifies the word. So this is a very strong word. And the two words that come together, there's a main verb and there's a prefix in front of it. The main verb means to stay in a place. It means to remain, to continue, to hold out, to stand fast, to stand against opposition, to stand still, to stand firm. That is the main verb in this word, endure. Then there is a prefix placed in front of it, and the prefix means under. In fact, the idea is to bear up under. And the idea is to bear up under great difficulty. That we would keep on loving others as we are under the difficulty of the strain of the relationship. It means to endure under 
as being under much pain. To persevere under personal rejection. This word endure carries the idea to calmly accept pain from another. To bear the words inflicted, the hurtful words inflicted by another. To endure in the face of personal rejection and opposition. I want you to know this is a very strong word that calls for very strong love in the face of very strong opposition. And Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that even unbelievers love those who love them. So it's no stretch to love other people who are, you have a lot of, in common with and are very gracious to you. The challenge for us in the kingdom of heaven is to endure all things under the stresses of interpersonal dynamics. I want to tell you something else about this word, endure. The more I dug into this word, the more interesting it became, and I began to see even greater nuances of the strength of this word. As I looked up every use of this word in the New Testament, I came to see that most often it is used in the theater of persecution. And I want to give you some cross-references, because it'll help you understand how strong of a word this is. In, Mar in Matthew 10, verse 22, Jesus said, You will be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. Do you, did you hear that? It is in the face of being hated by all others that you endure. In Matthew 24, verse 9, Jesus said, they will deliver you into, tempt, into tribulation and will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Then verse 13, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. It is to endure in the face of tribulation and hatred and the reality of being put to death for one's faith to press on in the face of such a gathering storm. In Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 32, the writer says, you endured, same word that's used in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, you endured a great conflict of suffering. It is to endure in the face of conflict and suffering. James 1, verse 12, speaks of the, the, the trials of life and being faced with mounting difficulties, James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who perseveres, same word, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. And so the idea is, is that one finds him or herself in conflict and trials and mounting difficulties, even persecution. And there is this tenacity to endure and to press on. And one other verse, 1 Peter 2, verse 20. I'm, and I'm not reading every occurrence in the New Testament, but just gathering these to give you a, a flavor and a feel. 1 Peter 2, verse 20. If when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it. This finds favor with God. So this word, endure, is really most often, the vast majority of the times used in the New Testament. It has to do with conflict and persecution and tribulation and being hated by someone else, and you bear up under it. And as it applies here in in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it is to bear up under the stress of difficulty in loving others, but you continue to endure. Let me give you one other verse. I just noticed this. 2 Timothy 2 verse 9, and I just really want to drive this home with us. Paul writes, I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. 
But the word of God is not in prison. For this reason, I endure all things. And so the idea here is the, of, of enduring on the battlefield when under attack and under assault. This is not a, this is not a word that is merely encouraging us to reach out to others and to press on when there is no difficulty in the relationship. It is when we find ourselves in the arena of conflict that we are to endure in loving others. I pulled together various quotations from different commentators that I read. I, I read many different commentaries to prepare each of these messages, and I would like to share with you how some of these commentators have amplified this endures all things. Because I, I want you to sense the strength of this word, and, and I want you to feel what God is requiring of you and me in this. A.T. Robertson, who is considered the greatest Greek scholar America has ever produced, writes of this word, endures all things. Love carries on like a stout-hearted soldier. In other words, we will not sound retreat. We will not go AWOL. We will not withdraw from the battlefield. We will not go look for a safe place to hide. We will remain on the front lines as we are loving others, even when they are firing at us, even when they are rejecting us, even when they are pouring out their hatred towards us, we will be a stout-hearted soldier and continue to love. Leon Morris, who is a luminous commentator, says, it is the endurance of the soldier who in the thick of the battle is undismayed. He understands the military nature of this word, for endure. Thistleton writes, love endures scorn, failure, and ingratitude. Matthew Henry, a timeless commentator, says, love holds firm, though it be much shocked and bored hard upon. It sustains all manner of injury and ill usage and bears up under it such as curses and revilings. That is the nature of this love. Another commentator says this refers to love's ability to hold out during trouble and affliction. Now, this is not to say that there are changes in relationships. Uh, there are times when we transfer maybe the time that we invest in a relationship from one person to another as there are passing seasons in all of our lives. And perhaps those that we once spent time with have drifted away from the Lord and our heart is so strong. We continue to love them, but we are looking for other strong hearts that we may run the race with. Now, this is not to say that there are not biblical grounds for divorce even. There are. And this is not to say that there does not come times when wisdom and prudence would call us to withdraw to an extent in how we present ourselves to others. But what this does say is that nevertheless, our love for others must remain stout-hearted as a soldier would in conflict, to keep on keeping on loving. Jonathan Edwards has only ever preached expositionally through one chapter in the entire Bible. It was 1 Corinthians. And those sermons uh, form a book. And in reading Edwards' sermon on this particular word, Jonathan Edwards writes, love will not fail, but will continue. Whatever assaults may be made upon it, yet it still remains and endures and does not cease and bears up and bears onward with constancy and perseverance and patience 
notwithstanding them all. John MacArthur writes, love holds fast to those it loves. It endures all things at all costs. It stands against overwhelming opposition and refuses to stop bearing or stop believing or stop hoping. Love will not stop loving. Close quote. This is the substance. This is not a shallow superficial idea of love. This is love with a steel backbone. This is love that is not tossed about by the waves of the sea. This is not puppy love, fickle emotional love. This is love that is rooted and grounded in commitment and steadfastness to other people. It's the substance of love. Note second, the scope. There are two words that follow endures, and that this will reveal to us the scope. To what extent does love endure? Under what circumstances does love endure? Are there any exceptions? What does our text say? Love endures all things. Please note how extensive and exhaustive this is. Love does not merely endure some things. It does not endure many things. It does not merely endure most things, but it endures all things. And it could be translated as an adverb, meaning always. Probably correctly here as an adjective, all things. Love endures all attacks all unkindnesses, all insults. Love endures all rejections, all cold shoulders, all verbal lashings. Love endures personal affronts. Love endures disappointments that come from other people when they are not what you want them to be. Love endures emotional hurts and internal pains. Love endures when people are insensitive and unkind. Love endures all betrayals. It endures all rudeness. It endures all misunderstandings. Love endures all the unforgiveness of others. Love endures all their faults, all their quirks, all their pettiness, all their abrasiveness. Love endures every excuse that we would offer by our flesh to stop loving. This is the scope of the substance of the love endures all things. Can you not begin to see the vastness of this? Can you not begin to sense the implications of this for our own personal lives? Do you not begin to see, Lord, how can I live this way? Lord, what must you do in me to make me this kind of a Christian? I certainly feel this, and we'll address that in a moment. But I want you to note third. We've looked at the substance, and we've looked at the scope. There's something else that bears our attention, the summation. And by the summation, I mean where this word finds itself in the list. It is the summation. It is the 15th and final virtue. Everything has, has built up to this. There is a sense of consummation of all that has preceded in this last virtue. Now, as you look at the text, the first thing that is most obvious is that it's the summation of verse 7. Notice the cadence. Notice the poetic beauty with which Paul writes this bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Four consecutive all things. These all cluster together. And what Paul is saying here is that love bears what is otherwise unbearable. 
Love believes what is otherwise unbelievable. Love hopes what is otherwise hopeless. And it becomes the summation of these four consecutive all things. This is what love is. It endures in bearing up. It endures in believing. It endures in hoping all things. But moreover, this final virtue of love at the end of verse 7 is also the summation of all 15 of these virtues of love that began in verse 4. In other words, each of the previous virtues of love should be read in light of this final virtue. I've already talked about this briefly beginning in verse 4, but let me just read through the list beginning in verse 4, and I want you to note how this last virtue really controls all the other, all the previous 14. Beginning in verse 4, this should read, Love endures with all patience. Love endures with all kindness. Love endures in not bragging. Love endures in not being arrogant. When we come to verse 5, it becomes the controlling factor of everything that is in verse 5 as well. Love endures in not acting becomingly. Love endures in not seeking its own. Love endures in not being provoked. Love endures in taking to account, in not taking into account, a wrong suffered. Each of these virtues must have this endurance and perseverance about it. And then in verse 6, love endures in not rejoicing in unrighteousness. Love endures in rejoicing in the truth. It is for this reason that I say that this last quality of love is the most important quality of all. I want you to consider fourth now, the standard. I need to see a picture of more graphically what this looks like. So what is the benchmark? What is the standard? What is the measure? What is the what would this look like to endure all things? The answer to that is very simple. It is seen in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is the personification of love endures all things. And as I have drawn to your attention in this series within a series, that this really is a description of Christ's likeness. Verses 4 through 7 each one of these descriptions are marks of Christ's likeness. This is exactly how Jesus lived during his incarnation, during his days here upon the earth. We are to walk as he walked, 1 John 2, verse 6, and we are to love as he loved. He is our example in all things. He is our elder brother. And so the standard for this is Jesus Christ himself. Think of the earthly life of Christ. Think of how he is the perfect embodiment of this, how he is the, the epitome of this. Jesus was rejected by the nation Israel, yet continued to weep over the city of Jerusalem, to say how I would have gathered you in as... A mother hen would gather her chicks. In the face of such decisive rejection by that unbelieving nation, Jesus endured all things. He was attacked by the Pharisees. They said that what he did, he did by the power of the devil. He was opposed by the scribes. He was confronted by the Sadducees. He was betrayed by Judas. He was denied by Peter. He was condemned by Pilate. He was crucified by Rome. And yet in the face of this opposition that none of us in this room can even begin to compare our lives to the trauma and to the troubles that he faced, through it all, Jesus endured all things in reaching out in love 
to those who were all around him. And Jesus endured with patience and kindness. He did not respond in like manner. And Jesus turned the other cheek, and he went the second mile. And Jesus did this towards his persecutors. In 1 Peter 2, verse 23, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. I would have loved to have had the last word in some of the things thrown at me. I would have had a quick, witty, sarcastic one-liner in your face coming back. And Jesus endured all things. He endured all things towards Judas. There is nothing more painful than being betrayed by someone who is close to you, who has allowed access into your private life. In John 13, verse 26, we read that when Jesus dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas in the upper room the night before his crucifixion and the night of his betrayal. And this was according to the ancient custom of at an Eastern meal, the host would offer one of the guests a morsel of bread as a gesture of special friendship. Jesus knowing that he would betray him and that the time was now. Even to the end, Jesus endured all things and even designated his betrayer by an act of love, a gesture of special friendship. And Jesus endured all things toward his disciples. What a challenging group they were. Just when it would appear they've got it, they've lost it. And were continually disappointing him again and again and again. And yet we read in John 13 verse 1, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. There was no end to his love for them, regardless of their failure, regardless of the tragedies that they carried out. He loved them to the end. In fact, he endured all things even toward his executioners. In Luke 23, 34, Jesus, as he is upon the cross, Jesus, as he has had nails driven into his hand and nails into his feet and as he is fastened and secured upon that cross, as he is the object of their hatred, the object of their ridicule, as they taunt him and mock him and, and gamble and cast lots for the garments that had been stripped from him as he hangs there naked, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And then towards you and me, Hebrews 12, verse 3, says of Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Jesus is the standard for your life, my friend. Let me bring this home to your heart. What kind of enduring love does God require of you and for me? And the answer is the standard is not the person sitting on your right nor sitting on your left. The standard is not your mother. The standard is not your spouse. The standard is not your grandmother. The standard is not the most loving person that you have ever known in your life. If you could just somehow be as enduring in your love as that person has been for you. No, they all fall infinitely short of the standard and the standard that is set before us, what God requires of me, what God requires of you. This is breathtaking to hear this again. But the standard is none other than the sinless Son of the living God, the Lord Jesus Christ. As He endured all things here upon the earth. And He has said to you and He has said to me, follow me. And implicit in this following after Christ is following Him in the example of His love that we would endure all things. Finally, the source. If you're like me, 
I've preached myself under some bit of conviction at this moment. I, I hope you're feeling some type of challenge, not by me, but by the Holy Spirit of God. Surely the Spirit of God lives within you. Surely the Spirit of God is taking the, the Word of God and making it clear to you what is God's requirement of your life. And we sense at this moment, Lord, how can I live this way? Who is adequate for this? And the answer to this is none of us except the reality of God living in us and supplying by His grace His supernatural supply of love that enables us to love those difficult people in our lives that are the greatest challenge to endure all things while each one of us is dwarfed by the intimidation of having to love people like that, I want you to know they are dwarfed by the supremacy of God and the supply of His infinite grace for our lives. And He enables us to do that which we could never do in our own strength. Where do we find such enduring love? It's not directly stated in the text, but we know from the full counsel of God that it is the supply of His grace. I'm going to give you just two texts to substantiate this, which should really be more than just mere validations to our mind, but should be ropes to drowning people, should be strength to those of us who are weak in this, to cling to. The first is a verse that's so simple that I've quoted so many times that I really hesitate to quote it one more time for fear you would say, do, do I not know any more of the Bible than to keep quoting this verse to you? But I need to hear this, you need to hear this, and it's still in our Bible. Galatians 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is. He will give nine marks of the fruit of the Spirit. Number one on the list is love. Love for God, certainly. Love for His Word, yes. But also love for His people. And even love for those who are outside the kingdom of God. This is not something that we just ratchet up from within ourselves. This is something that must be given to us from above. Really from within by the Holy Spirit of God. For this to say the fruit of the Spirit is love, meaning means that it is the Holy Spirit of God who indwells every believer who supplies in abundant measure the love that we need to exhibit towards others. The fruit of the Spirit is love, means this love is produced by the Spirit who indwells us, this assumes that we are walking in the Spirit and walking by the Spirit. This doesn't just automatically happen. There is requirement and responsibility on our part to live in purity of life and to be confessing our sin and to be repenting and to be pursuing holiness and to be saturated with His Word, and to be living in community with other believers who are strengthening us and, and bearing us in this walk. This is required as we would be filled with the Spirit. So I would say to you first, what is the source 
of such love that seems impossible? The answer to that is the Holy Spirit. And greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And greater is he who is in you than any challenge you will ever face and any difficult person that would be out there for you to love. And just remember, you're difficult to love, to be loved by someone out there also. The other text that I, that I want to set before you, and this will conclude the message, you can turn to it, 2 Corinthians 6, verses 4 through 6. This is a, a precious little nugget of a passage that is often overlooked, that escapes the headlines that other texts seem to feature from this book. This is a, a text that sometimes is under the radar, but there is a precious truth for this, and this should be a treasure for us today uh, to see this and to take this home. The first text I gave you is one I've given again and again and again and again, but this is one perhaps we have not yet looked at together. In 2 Corinthians 6, in verse 4, notice how Paul starts. But in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God, no, in much endurance. There's our word that's used in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7. It is the very same word. It is the word endurance. It means bearing up under enormous difficulty. It means withstanding the shock of battle. It means to, to bear up under hard and difficult circumstances. That's what this word endurance means. Now, what follows? Notice the descriptions of this difficulty. Afflictions, which refer to the, the batterings of life. Emotionally, physically, spiritually. Hardships, that refers to mounting difficulties. Distresses, that means to be confined in a tight place where there is no escape, literally. And it's trials with, with no escape. And then in verse 5, he continues to flesh out the, the, the difficulties under which this endurance is pressing on. Without these following descriptions, we would just see the word endurance and go, okay, I guess that means having to hang in there a bit. And then you read these descriptions, afflictions, hardships, distresses. And then in verse 5, beatings, that means blows with fists, being hit with rods. In imprisonments, we understand what that means, being thrown into prison. In tumults, that means mob violence. That means public riots. Uh, in labors, that means hard work to the point of exhaustion. In sleeplessness, uh, that means tirelessly enduring. And then in hunger, with great self-deprecation. Now look at verse 6. In purity, meaning none of this has driven him away from holiness. In knowledge, the knowledge of God. In patience, in kindness. Those are the first two in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Love is patient, love is kind. But now note, in the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the one who empowers the endurance in verse 4. It is God in us who is at work both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And then he follows up in genuine love. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 is, is all about. It's love without hypocrisy, love without giving up on people, love that hangs in there, love that won't let go, love that endures under every type of difficulty. And the source is the Holy Spirit of God. Now I want to encourage us to see every challenge that we face in our lives as that which would 
cause us to rely upon the Holy Spirit even more. And I want to assure us of the sufficiency of the Spirit and of His abundance of grace. We have but a thimble of need. He has oceans and reservoirs of grace to to fill the little thimble of our life to overflowing, to be immersed and to be drowning in the fullness of His grace. Waves upon waves of divine enablement that He grants to us. And in no way does it remove the challenge. In no way does it remove the difficulty. But those things drive us to God. They humble us before our God. They cause us to call out upon our God. And God is faithful to provide for us all that we need. It has been well said, it is not how you start the race that counts. It is how you finish. Many start well. Not all end well. It's been well said, many in their Christian life, they go up like a rocket, they come down like a rock. How important it is that we finish strong. So it is with love. It is not how you start loving people. It is how you finish. It is how you endure. It is how you persevere. With most people, it's easy to start the relationship. So many people make a good first impression. And then the more you get to know them, therein lies the challenge and the difficulty. The strengths may have been seen initially and not the flaws and not the difficulties. And then as you grow closer to that person or rub shoulders with them, it becomes glaringly obvious what is perhaps blind to them. But as God is at work in that person we trust, God must be at work in us. And God must grant us supernatural love that endures all things. It is the mark of mature love. It is the mark of Christian love. It is the mark of deepening love that we press on through the challenges, that we persevere through the difficulties, and that we endure in love through all things. Surely, as I have preached this message, there are different people, different faces, different names that have flashed before you. It may be someone you live with. It may be someone that you grew up with. It may be someone in your immediate family that lives under another roof. It may be someone that you serve the Lord with. It may be someone that you work with. There will be those people in all of our lives. You would have to live in a phone booth on an island by yourself for there not to be someone in your life. This speaks to how much we need the Lord and how much how much we must rely upon His grace. As I conclude this message, I ask you to give me just another moment. If you find yourself here today without Christ, you have no capacity whatsoever to love like this. You you have none. And the reason is, is because you don't have the Lord. And if you're here without Christ, I have to assume that God brought you here today for a purpose and for a reason, and that that reason is for your good. And I want to tell you of Christ. Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. He is the creator of all that there is. And he was sent into this world 2,000 years ago on a mission of salvation. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. 
Ultimately, he came that he might go to a cross. He was born of a virgin, meaning he had no sin nature and could therefore live a sinless and perfect life and live in full obedience to the law of God that you and I break again and again and again. For us, the wages of sin is death. Yet for Christ, he kept the law perfectly. He was qualified, therefore, to go to the cross and to die in the place of sinners. If he had been with sin, he would have been dying for his own sin. But he was without sin and able to die in the place of sinners. There upon that cross, as he was lifted up, it was for the very distinct purpose that he would die bearing our sins. The Father took our sins and transferred them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And him who knew no sin, God made to be sin for us. God imputed our sins to Christ. God laid our sins upon the innocent, sacrificial lamb, Jesus Christ. God the Father poured out the wrath deserving us upon him. Jesus, in dying in our place, made the only sacrifice for our sins. He made the only atonement for our sins. By his death, he has secured forgiveness of sin and eternal life for all who will call upon his name. He was taken down from the cross. He was buried. And on the third day, God raised him from the dead to give demonstration that his death upon the cross was fully sufficient to save everyone who calls upon Christ. He has ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father. He has all authority in heaven and earth. And the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There is nothing you can do to earn. There's nothing you can do to merit. There is nothing you can do to, to deserve the gift of salvation. It is offered as a free gift. What must you do? What must I do to be saved? You must look away from yourself. You must look away from the world. You must confess, God, have mercy upon me, the sinner. Jesus only saves sinners. He does not save good people. He does not save righteous people. He only saves people who come to him and say, Lord, have mercy upon me, the sinner. He is the friend of sinners. He has much forgiveness for sinners. He came for sinners. You must tell him what a sinner you are. You must tell him how you have failed and fallen short of his glory. Come clean with God. And then commit your life to Christ. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Believe upon him. Entrust your life to him. And him who comes unto me, Jesus said, I will in no wise cast out. He will receive you today. I know that he will. He will receive you today into his arms of grace and forgiveness. And he will enter your life. He will pardon all of your sins. He will reconcile you to the Father. He will put his Holy Spirit within you. You will become a new creature. The old things will pass away. It will be over. And a new life will have come. You will have given up dirt for diamonds. It's the greatest offer that could ever be extended to you. But you must receive it by faith. And so I would urge you this day, if you are under the awareness that I need a Savior, that I'm lost, Christ is here today. 
and he has come to seek and to save sinners just like you. Perhaps you will be found by him today. Let us pray.